Praise the Lord, everybody. We want to thank God for Freedom Fellowship Christian Church. We're having our services via the internet, and uh, we are thankful that you have uh, logged in to us just to check out this service and to rejoice with us. We are looking forward to God doing great and glorious things, even in this unusual day and time in which we live. Uh, you probably noticed that the backdrop is not uh, like what you are accustomed to. Uh, that's because we're at Christ Covenant Presbyterian Church in Farragut. Uh, we're recording our services here, uh, and we want to first of all thank Pastor Seth Hammond and his staff here at Christ Covenant. Uh, we want to thank particularly Brother Chris and also Brother Thad for their assistance to make this day possible. Not only that, but we're thankful for our own praise and worship team here today. We have a few voices from the Voices of Praise and our own Minister of Music, uh, John Jackson. And so we're looking forward to giving a glory and honor to God and praise God wherever you are, wherever you are viewing this. And we're just praying that God would have his way and that this song, these songs and this message would impact uh, the global community. So Go ahead and worship God with us. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all. Of you could ask or think according to the
God the praise. Amen. Hallelujah. He's able. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. No matter what you're going through, God is able. Hallelujah.
First of all, we want to give praise and glory and honor to God. We are so thankful uh, for this day. Even in the unusual times in which we live, we still acknowledge the fact that God is still great. And I pray that you'll continue to acknowledge that even through this test and trial that we find ourselves going through, because he's such a faithful God. He's been a faithful God unto you and unto me. And we have no reason to doubt his power, his love, and his ability. And uh, we just c need to continue to lift up the praises of God, uh, lift up our praise to him, and just acknowledge how great and how wonderful he is. And you do know that the God that I'm referring to has a son named Jesus. I say that all the time, that he has a son named Jesus, and we don't want to mistake him uh, for any other God that other people worship out there, because we give glory and honor to the God of the universe who has a son named Jesus Christ who died to be our Savior. <clears throat> and even as we um, uh, continue in the spirit of worship, uh, we want to thank God, first of all, for our music ministry. They do a wonderful job each and every week ministering unto us. Uh, we thank God for Sister Darlene Hayes, Sister Cynthia Ghostin, Sister Janissa Oden, and also Sister Lisa Smith. Uh, and I even have my wife in the audience with me on today. Uh, so we're thankful to God uh, anyhow. And um, one of the things, Freedom Fellowship, that you know that I often emphasize is how grateful I am to be able to come to the house of God to worship uh, with the people of God as we look at the Word of God. And I try to share on a, a consistent basis how we should not take those opportunities for granted. And so now, uh, I definitely miss each and every one of you. We're not uh, um, able to worship corporately in a local facility, but we are able to worship corporately uh, via technology, and we can still give God the glory and the praise that he deserves right where we are. We're going to continue in our sermon series from the book of Genesis. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It says, So Abram left Egypt and traveled north into the Negev, along with his wife and Lot and all that they owned. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. From the Negev, they continued traveling by stages toward Bethel, and they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. This was the same place where Abram had built the altar, and there he worshiped the Lord again. I want us to be prayerful on the subject, back to Bethel. Back to Bethel. I believe that this is... Um, a word that the Lord is speaking unto the people of God on today, or maybe just people all around the world, that we need to make our pilgrimage and our trek back to Bethel. And for the background of this particular passage of Scripture found in Genesis 13, 1 through 4, we like to look at Genesis 12 in its entirety. Because when you look at the first verse of Genesis 12, it deals with the presence of God. The presence of God uh, was present, or God was present um, in the presence of Abraham. He actually spoke to Abraham. He's not known as Abraham as of yet. He's known as Abram. Uh, but we see that the Lord shows up and the Lord speaks to this individual. He gives him specific instructions. He tells him to leave the, his family, uh, his friends. He tells him to leave the familiar, and as we learned on last week, to go out on a journey of faith. He said, because uh, you do not know where it is that I'm going to take you, but you can rest assured that I'll be with you while on this journey. And then when you take a look at verse 2, then we see God's promises, because he promises Abram, he says, I will make your name great, I will make a great nation, and then you will also be a great blessing even to your neighbors. And then he gives individuals this warning. He says, uh, for the individuals that bless you, I will bless them. But then for the nations or for the people who curse you, I will also curse them. 
And then the part that I like most of all about this text in Genesis 12, it says, Abram then went, or Abram obeyed the word of God. He did exactly what God had instructed him to do. He set out on this journey of faith, and while on this journey of faith, he was confronted with many tests. We talked about on last week how he was tested in three particular areas. He was tested in the area of circumstances because he was confronted with a famine. He was tested in the area of people because he had to deal with a proud or prideful ruler by the name of Pharaoh while he was in Egypt. But then he also was tested in the area of things or flocks. Uh, the flocks and the wealth that both he and his nephew Lot had accumulated, uh, they were, uh, th these resources rather, it brought division among the family and it caused friction and there was fighting among these family members and then eventually they had to go their separate ways. And so when we see this, we see that this problem, first of all, uh, was allowed by God. Uh, when you take a look at Genesis 12, 10 through 20, these challenges that Abram was confronted with, he, it was allowed by God. It was allowed by God. And so what the text teaches us is this. Yes, we thank God for his promises, but then we also need to anticipate problems, that problems will come our way even in light of the promises that God has made unto the people of God. See, sometimes what we often think is this, is that once we establish a relationship with God and once God reveals unto us his promises and our purpose, that we will be exempt from problems and from pain. But instead, what we often see is that the problems and even our pain intensifies. Uh, sometimes we have problems because we are connected to Christ, because we are living in a relationship with God, because we are on a journey of faith and our faith must be tested. It has to be tested in the same way that Abram's faith was tested. Uh, one of the reasons why God tests our faith or allow for the test to come is to verify our faith. It's not like he doesn't know what kind of faith we have, but he wants to reveal and expose to you and to me uh, the faith that we have, whether it's a weak faith or a strong faith. So he will verify our faith, but he will also purify our faith. It's just like uh, trials come to purge the dross or the fire, fiery trials. The fire uh, will, uh, when whenever gold is heated, it will cause uh, that which is invaluable or that which is waste, it will cause it to rise to the top to surface so that it can then be discarded of and disposed of because God wants to hold on to and maintain that which is of great value. So what I want to encourage us to do on this morning is this. Uh, while we're going through this trial and while we're experiencing this unusual day, uh, let's not toss our faith, but let us hold on to our faith. Let us maintain our faith and our convictions and continue to trust in God. See, God allowed for the circumstances to arise in the life of Abram, just like he allowed for this situation to arise globally and internationally uh, and in our lives also personally and individually. When you take a look at Genesis 12 and 10, it talks about the severity of the problem when uh, Abram was confronted first with a famine. It talked about it being a great famine or a severe famine. So this was out of the norm. It was unusual. Uh, but then secondly, uh, when you see this, it says as a result of this severe problem, look at the decision-making process of Abram because it teaches us, it teaches us uh, how to respond or how not to respond. What I mean by that is this. We can learn from a good example, but we can also learn from a bad example. From a good example, we can learn what to do. From a bad example, we can learn what not to do. And unfortunately, Abram set a bad example in the way that he responded to the crisis that confronted his life because he was in a place called Bethel. 
Bethel in the Hebrew, it means house of God, or it means holy place. Here he was, he was confronted with a need, although he was in a holy place. He was confronted with a need, although he was in the house of God, or a place that was referred to as the dwelling place of God. Yet and still, he was confronted with a need. But look at how Abram responded to the need when it arose and this severe problem that confronted his life. It says that he left Bethel and he went to Egypt. Egypt is more than a geographical location. Egypt, it symbolizes an evil world system. Uh, and so what he does is he, he doubts the word of God and the promises that were made unto him in the preceding verses. And now he is uh, reliant upon an evil world structure and an evil world system. So he leaves the word to now rely on the world. And that was a drastic mistake that Abram made to doubt the word of God and the promises of God, to then become reliant on a faulty structure and a faulty system, an evil world system. Even when you look at Genesis 10, it says that Abram went down to Egypt because whenever you step outside of the will of God, whenever you begin to doubt the word of God, uh, you are on your way down. And so he experiences this great descent he is on his way down, and now he is acting out of character, and he's not acting like the man of God that he's been called to be. Uh, you can take a look at it because when you look at verses 11 through 13, it talks about how he went into a self-preservation mode. Don't take my word for it, but let's read the Word of God together for ourselves. Because in verse 11, it says, As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abram said to his wife, Sarai, Look, you are a very beautiful woman. Verse 12, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is your wife. Let's kill him, then we can have her. So then listen to what he says in verse 13. So please tell them you are my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. So he goes into a self-preservation mode. Uh, what does that mean? That means he is now putting himself before others, others whom he's responsible for, others that he himself should protect. Now he's asking them to lie for him so that he will then be protected and spared any further, uh, any further problems or any further trial or any further uh, issues in his life. He puts his wife at risk so that he can then be preserved, so that he will be safe, uh, so that his life will not be taken. And then this, this is what he does in verses 14 through 16. When you take a look at these verses, it lets us know that because of this selfishness, this self-preservation, he resorts to spousal prostitution. Listen to it. In verses 14 through 16, it says, And sure enough, when Abram arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarah's beauty. So they noticed the beauty of his wife Sarah, just like he suspected. Verse 15, when the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarai was taken into his palace. So now what they are doing, they're preparing her to become a part of his harem. Then in verse 16, then Pharaoh the king gave Abram, Sarai's husband, many gifts because of her. He gave him sheep, he gave him goats, he gave him cattle, both male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. So now, not only is his life being preserved, but he is also prospering, but it's at the exploitation of the one that he calls himself loving. It's spousal prostitution. He puts her out there in order to benefit himself. He's making bad and poor decisions. But how many of us thank God for divine intervention? 
because as we take a look at the severity of the problem and how he resorts to self-preservation and spousal prostitution, I also see sovereign protection. There's divine intervention in verses 17 through 20. It says, but the Lord. And we ought to stop right there because there's a but the Lord in your life and in my life and in all of our lives. Because if it hadn't have been for the Lord, we know that we would not be where we are and who we are. Uh, that we will, would not have made it as far as we have. It says, but the Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarah, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and accused him sharply, says, what have you done to me, he demanded. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and get out of here. He is evicted from Egypt. And then it says in verse 20, Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them, and he sent Abram out of the country along with his wife and all of his possessions. They even escorted him to the border of Egypt. They evicted him out of their country because he should not have been there in the first place. Because he stepped outside of the will of God, he resorted to making poor decisions. Uh, because he stepped out of the will of God, he was in a spiritual uh, descent. Uh, he was spiraling down. Uh, because he stepped outside of the will of God, he almost forsook the promises that God made to him. But it was God who intervened to save uh, Abram, his wife Sarah, and also his nephew Lot that we will later on discover who is also traveling with his uncle. And not only that, but even the workers and the servants and the possessions, all that belonged and was connected to Abram, God spared it. He saved it, and then they utilized those resources for what God had in store or for what was next. But how then did Abram correct his decision? Freedom Fellowship, you know that I often say one way to overcome a bad decision is by making another decision. Uh, and that decision needs to be a good decision, and the only good decisions that you and I can make is a godly one. And so whenever we find ourselves outside of the will of God, whenever we are in an Egypt-type situation, what we really need to do then is make our way back to Bethel. And that's the encouragement that I see in the text in chapters 13, chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, because that's where we picked up. Abraham left where he was. He left Egypt, and then he traveled to Bethel. Check this out. It says that he went back to the place where he last had contact with God. See, when he was uh, in Egypt and had discarded the word and was depending upon the world, he resorted from uh, believing God and trusting God and resorted to scheming. Uh, when he stepped outside of the will of God, he forsook his confidence and he resorted to fear. When he stepped outside of the will of God, he began to put himself above and over others. When he stepped outside of the will of God, he was supposed to initially be a blessing to other nations, but instead they experienced the judgment of God, and it was because of the actions and the activity of the man of God. He stepped outside of the realm of God's um, authority, if you will. He, he didn't allow the Lord to be the Lord. He didn't allow God to be God. Uh, and when he was in Egypt, you notice that he didn't seek God. Uh, he didn't build an altar to God like he had in Bethel. He didn't worship God while in Egypt like he did in Bethel. So that meant that he had no God. That meant that he had no guidance. And that also meant that he had no governance. No God, that's no absolute authority in his life. And because of that, no guidance. Because when we're not relying upon the word of God, then uh, we don't know what to believe. And we will adopt anything 
any and everything and make it a part of our belief system. And then when our belief system has been corrupted and polluted, we will resort to anything. We will find ourselves doing anything. It will resort into or result into uh, ungodly uh, uh, behavior and ungodly activity. It reminds me of a recent experience that my oldest son, Jeremy, had. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I was on the phone with him, and he was at a gas station, and he told me that he had a headache. And so I heard him interacting uh, with the person behind the counter. Uh, he asked the person, he said, do you have any? And he was very specific. He said, do you have any Excedrin? And I heard the person behind the counter uh, reply, and their response was, yes, I do have Excedrin. Then they even went one step further and they said, do you want Excedrin for migraines or do you want Excedrin extra strength? He said, I want Excedrin extra strength. And then the man gave him a packet evidently. And my son, thank God, read the packet and then he asked the question, what is this? And the man responded by saying these words specifically. He said, that's Excedrin. Then when Jeremy read the package further, he said, but on this packaging, it does not say Excedrin at all. The person behind the counter responded by saying, but that's what I call Excedrin. And he said, on the label, it had C-O-N and then R-X. He said, I don't know what this is, and I'm not even sure if it will work. The man responded by saying, I'm not sure it will work either. It's what I call Excedrin, but I see that Excedrin is not on the label, so I would now recommend that you use Tylenol because we know Tylenol works. And what I noticed was that this man tried to sell my son a bill of goods. Even on the package itself, it had C-O-N, that's a con. Uh, it was a generic form of something that was supposed to bring relief uh, to his head or to his life. Uh, but if he hadn't read the package, if, if he hadn't done his own research, if he, if he hadn't looked at it closely, he would not have known or even understood that this is not the real thing, but it's a, it, it's a cheap substitute for the real thing. And that substitute cannot or may not give you the same results or the same relief that you're seeking from something that is genuine or from something that is authentic, something that is the original. And, and that's the same way it is in our life today. It, it, there's a whole lot of cheap substitutes out there for God. There's a lot of things and a lot of people and a lot of other stuff that people worship and that they look to uh, it, look toward in their time of need, but it's a cheap substitute. And, and we need to read in the Word of God uh, in order to find out what is authentic, what is real, what is effective, what it is that we truly need to bring to us the relief that we're seeking in our life. Uh, and, and so uh, I was so glad that he rejected the cheap substitute and went for something that have, had a proven track record. Uh, and, and that's what I'm here to tell you on today is that we need to stick with God because he has a proven track record. He has brought us from a mighty long way. He's always been there for us in the past. Uh, in the past, and somebody else said it like this, he is a faithful God, and so we need to remain faithful to him and watch God work. So, so when we take a look at this, how, how did, how did uh, Abram get back on track? Real quick, the way he got back on track was, first of all, he was rebuked by God. He was rebuked by God. What does it mean to be rebuked by God? That means that he was reprimanded. Uh, that means that he was corrected. He was told what he was doing wrong. Now, God didn't specifically come from heaven to and tell him what it was that he was doing wrong. But through Pharaoh, uh, he was then revealed or it was exposed what it was that he had done wrong. And it wasn't punitive. God didn't expose it to 
punish Abram, but he exposed Abram and his uh, faulty, uh, his erroneous behavior and all. He, he exposed that so that he would have the opportunity to correct it. And so once he was rebuked by God, then when we look at Genesis 13 and 1, he repented before God. To repent me is more than a desire to accept the consequences of sin, uh, but it is a commitment to a renewed relationship with God. He had gotten off track with God. He had forsaken the things of God. He came to the realization of that after being rebuked by God. So then he repented uh, before God. Uh, it was more than him just saying that he was sorry or that he was remorseful, but there was a turning away from. There was a turning away from his sin and a turning to God. How do we know that? Because in verse 3 of the same chapter, it says that he went back to Bethel. That was the last place he had encountered God. That was the last place where he had resided. That was the last place where he built an altar in order to worship God. That was the last place where he had called upon the name of the Lord. All I'm simply trying to say, and I'm probably taking 45 minutes or so to say it, is this. Could it be that God has allowed what we currently are experiencing in order to get us to go back to Bethel, in order to get us to return back to God, in order for us to get our lives back on track, in order for us to return to the very things that we have forsaken but has brought us safely thus far. I believe he's trying to get us to go back to Bethel, back to our altar, back to that place of worship, back to that place of sacrifice, back to that place where we trusted God, where we heard clearly from God, where we experienced the presence of God, where we were totally and completely reliant upon God. Could it be that he's trying to get us back to that holy place, uh, that place where we treasured and valued our experiences and interaction and relationship with God? It says he returned to Bethel, and then once he returned to Bethel, this is the part I like. It says he called upon the name of the Lord. And that's what I believe that the Lord is trying to get us to do is to call upon his holy and righteous name. He's trying to get us to call upon him in our time of trouble. He's trying to get us to call upon him in our time of need. Somebody else said it like this. They said, you don't know God is all you need until God is all you have. And God is all that we have. And so we need to return to Bethel so that we can call upon his name. When did he call upon his name? In, in, in worship. In other words, once we have been rebuked by God, once we repent before God, once we return to God, then we are able to rejoice with God. And I don't know about you, but I told you that the test has come for two reasons, to verify our faith or to purify our faith. And that is true. But what I look forward to is the opportunity when we can testify about our faith, when we can testify about the goodness of the Lord, when we can tell other people, our children and our children's children, how the Lord made a way when there appeared to be no way, when all hope was lost when we didn't know what else to do, uh, when we called upon the name of the Lord, he came to our rescue. I pray that somebody listening to, to me today will understand this, is, this will not be the only time God comes to our rescue because he came to our rescue 2,000 years ago. That's when he proved and he demonstrated his love for you and for me. He came to our rescue because we were lost in sin. Uh, he came to our rescue because we deserved to die and go to a burning hell. We, we, we deserve to be eternally separated from God, never uh, allowed to fellowship or to worship God or even to have a relationship 
with God. But then Jesus became a bridge between sinful man and a holy God. And once we accept and believe in the sacrificial and atoning death of Jesus Christ, he gives us access to God, our Father, who sent his Son to come to our rescue and to snatch us from the very bowels of hell. We need to get back to Bethel, back to that place where we had forsaken God and abandoned God and neglected God. Go back to Bethel and become the people that he desires for us to be and be totally dependent and reliant upon him instead of this wicked and evil world system which we have become accustomed to believe in. Let us bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that somebody under the sound of my voice on this day that they would take heed to the word that we believe has come forth from you, that we would uh, Lord, just return back to Bethel, that the holy place, the house of God, that place where we first encountered you, where we truly just treasured uh, our interaction with you, uh, our relationship with you. Lord, I pray uh, that we would go back to that place of peace, uh, back to that place where we experienced your power. Uh, back to that place where we were just sold out and surrendered to you and totally committed to you. Lord, I just pray that that would occur among the people of God. You have said in your word that if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. I will heal their land. If we as the faithful remnant of God would return back unto you, then I believe as a result of our relationship with you and our connectedness to you, that then the others whom we are connected with that may not know you as their Savior, that we can have an influence, a positive and godly influence upon their life and win them to the kingdom of God and get them to experience a place like Bethel where we can reside in the very presence of God where we can experience your security and the safety the peace, the joy, the comfort, the love all that only you and you alone can provide Lord forgive us for times when we've looked to other things or other people to do for us or to be for us what only you can be and only and, 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 and Lord just uh, we pray that we would never put something else or somebody else ever again in your place Lord uh, we we pray that during this time of social distancing that we would use this as an opportunity to draw close to you it's in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Let the people of God say, Amen. 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 Uh, thank you. I pray for you. We're praying with you. Continue to pray for us as well. We will get through this by the grace of God. And um, we're going to continue to honor God even in the midst of trials. I uh, just wanted to lift up a few announcements uh, to you before we close out. First of all, I just wanted you to know, Freedom Fellowship, that we've suspended all activities until April the 4th. So we will continue to watch the news and get direction and instruction from the CDC uh, to then determine when we can enter back into corporate worship. Uh, we do plan on doing another uh, streaming service on next week, whether it's pre-recorded or live. That hasn't been determined yet. Uh, but we want to continue to worship together as the people of God. And we want you to continue to be faithful in your giving. Uh, if you have not downloaded the Givelify app, please do so. Uh, you can attach your credit card or debit card to that Givelify app and do a search for Freedom Fellowship Christian Church. A picture of me and my wife as, long, as well as the church will uh, come up on the screen uh, to verify that that's the right location. Uh, and then you can go through the app, give through the app, and, um, and still be a blessing 
uh, to the church and to the ministry because the ministry will go on as we minister to others. Uh, and if you don't have that technology or if you're not comfortable with that, then uh, feel free to mail your checks, uh, those financial resources to the church. The address is 4027 Paper Mill Drive, 4027 Paper Mill Drive, 37909. Please uh, be faithful to you, to the ministry. Uh, please give so that we can continue to serve. Uh, let's pray for one another. Let's check on one another. Um, you will be able to see these services on YouTube. Um, uh, of course, you should, if you're watching it today, you already know that, but we will uh, contact you uh, via text. Uh, and if you need to contact us, you can also call the church. Uh, that number is 865 212 3450. 865 212 3450. Uh, we just want to encourage you to keep the faith, keep trusting, keep believing in God. All things are in His hand. And with that, 